Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'd like to open our uh, workshop for the textbook commission for the state of Tennessee on March 19th at 10 o'clock Central Standard Time. Uh, we have several new members, uh, so I'm going to ask that we introduce ourselves this morning before we start the workshop. I'm Vicki Kirk. I'm the Deputy Commissioner and Chief Academic Officer for the state of Tennessee, and I sit on the commission in the commissioner's stead in the absence of a chair because um, Dr. Campbell has left the commission. The secretary serves as chair until a chair can be elected. So I will serve as chair this morning for the workshop and the very first part of the meeting. Uh, once a chair is elected, then we will hand that over to the chairman. Uh, so let's start down here with Mr. Mallory, and I'd like to say thank you to Mr. Mallory for agreeing to come back. Uh, policy provides that uh, commissioners whose terms have expired will serve until their replacements are appointed and approved, and that is Mr. Mallory's situation, and he has graciously agreed to come this morning so that we may have a quorum. Uh, Kyle Mallory, Stewart County High School, uh, social studies teacher. Uh, I've taught for about 10 years, uh, chairman of a lot of other things and commissions, and um, glad to be back. Thank you. Neil Durbin, Dyersburg City Schools. I'm the director of schools. I also teach AP Human Geography. Randall Fenimore, the federal programs director and the K-5 literacy supervisor for Chester County Schools. Karen King, I am the principal of a pre-K-8 school called Westside in Cannon County. I am also have just rolled off of being the principal study council chair for the state, and I'm serving in an advisory role with the um, principal study council now. Thank you. Rachel Brew, I'm the recording secretary for the commission. I'm also the administrative assistant for Dr. <coughs> Tammy Shelton for the Department of Ed. Hi, Joanna Collins, assistant general counsel for procurement for the Department of Education, and I'm here to support the work of the commission. Hello, I'm Kay Kelsey, and I'm from Memphis, and I'm a retired early childhood teacher with the Shelby County Schools. I'm Frank Cagle. I'm a retired newspaper man from Knoxville, Tennessee. And Tammy, if you'd introduce yourself to the commission, please. I'm Tammy Shelton. I'm the Senior Executive Director of Content and Assessment Design for the department, um, and the team that I work on supports the commission in their work. And I would also tell the commission that um, Allison Gower wa was the previous uh, director of content, and she helped to organize the commission when she was working with the department. She has left the department December of 2017, and we are working to find a replacement for that position. Um, so now that we've introduced ourselves and uh, we're ready to go, uh, the workshop is a little more uh, informal than the meeting. Uh, Dr. Shelton is going to lead us through the documents in your notebook and talk about what we are going to do in the meeting today. Uh, if you have questions at any time, please feel free to ask them. We want to make the workshop useful to you. And at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Shelton. Thank you, Dr. Kirk. Um, as Dr. Kirk said, I'm going to walk you through all the materials in your notebook that we will end up uh, looking at during the actual meeting. So please feel free to um, ask questions at any time um, that you need to. Uh, the first thing I would like us to do is look at our agenda for the actual meeting, and that's in the pocket of your notebook uh, on the left-hand side. So if you would pull out uh, your agenda, we'll basically, we'll just go through that very quickly. Uh, the front of the first page is the workshop agenda, which we will go through um, here in just a minute. Uh, but if you'll flip to the back of the first page, it actually has the agenda for the meeting. Um, of course, item number one is Welcome and introductions, as always. Um, Dr. Kirk, as the secretary uh, and an officer to the commission, will open, since we uh, don't have an active chair at this point, uh, with roll call and then introduction, again, of the staff so that it will be on official record. We'll also move right into the adoption of the agenda uh, and approval of minutes from our last meeting, which was October 2nd, 2017. Um, action items that we will um, address uh, for this meeting or that you will address for this meeting will be first to elect a chair, second to elect a vice chair. Um, then you will go into um, the instructional materials substitution and uh, as I talk through the workshop here in just a second I'll explain that in more detail. 
approval of the screening instruments for Section D, uh, and then approval of panelists, the reviewers that will review the, the materials that are bid in Section D. Um, presentations under Item 4 are acknowledgement of the bids that were sent in for Section D, um, and then some announcements at the end. And if there is any other business that the chairman acknowledges, you would move into that before uh, the meeting adjourns. Um, any questions about the agenda? Okay, then let's go into workshop items. Um, so item listed as number one um, is the minutes from October 2nd. So if you'll look behind tab number one in your notebook, you have your draft of your minutes from October 2nd. I would like to give you about a minute. I know you've received these materials uh, last week, and I'm sure that you've already looked at it. Uh, but just another uh, couple of minutes to look through those minutes. Um, is there anything uh, that you see, that sort of thing? And then you'll have the, um, the opportunity during the actual meeting to make any corrections if needed before you approve. Are there any questions about the October 2nd minutes? Okay, then let's move on to our next item. If you'll look behind tab number two, at each workshop, we have commission reminders. So usually we pull uh, policies, especially if it's a policy that is uh, something that we're fixing to review or look at, but we generally usually just pull policies as a reminder uh, for the commission um, just to kind of to review. Uh, this time we've actually pulled uh, the uh, roles and responsibilities of different individuals uh, that lead to our official list uh, of textbooks and instructional materials and then the policies around the commission's uh, duties. Um, and so the first uh, sheet that you have behind tab number two um, is a document that lists the roles and responsibilities of everyone involved in the adoption of instructional materials and textbooks. Um, the very first box, as you see, is the General Assembly, um, and you can read through that. Uh, the General Assembly, as you know, uh, is responsible uh, for appointments to this commission, and then also, of course, um, items that are in statute around the commission and the adoption of instructional materials. Um, this commission is appointed by all three branches, so the governor appoints three members, and then we have um, the Speaker of the House and our Lieutenant Governor each also appointing three, and then the tenth member uh, is the Commissioner of Education or um, designee, which in this case is Dr. Kirk. Um, the commission, as you know, that is you. Um, your responsibilities are to oversee uh, the selection process of um, the instructional materials, uh, which starts with uh, policies that are made around uh, the selection of instructional materials, selecting the actual um, individuals that review the materials, um, approving um, and looking at the screening instrument that is used for instructional materials, and then um, finally reviewing um, the uh, list that is recommended to you by the reviewers. Um, and you will um, create, uh, take that list that is recommended to you by the panelist. Uh, of course, you would approve possibly if you needed to make changes as needed, and then you would recommend that list to the state board, and that happens in October of each year. Um, so really managing all the processes and all the documents around the selection of instructional materials that leads to an official state list that districts can then uh, review themselves within their local communities and select books for their classrooms. Um, the state advisory panels, those are the individuals that will review the books and you will see that on our agenda today. 
um, the Department of Education supports you in your work. So we will help you with preparing those materials and present uh, information to you so that you can make decisions in the best interest of our students and teachers across the state. And then local districts um, have the final decision. So once they um, get the list that you have recommended to state board, then state board approves, then it's the local district's decision to really dig deep and review those materials and make sure they uh, match and meet their unique needs within their communities. Uh, so that's just a little general overview of each um, group's responsibilities towards instructional materials. Um, the next page is policy 1.30, uh, and that's the commission meetings, uh, which we are uh, going to have here in just a few minutes. Uh, first, it has attendance of commission members, of course, in the policy, and encouraged to uh, attend each meeting. Uh, we also have a quorum requirement of seven of the ten uh, members as well. Uh, location of the meetings, we generally try to have them right here centrally located in Nashville. Meetings are also live streamed, as you know, um, as well, with the links posted uh, so that any individual, if they're not able, able to be here physically, can watch all of the meetings. Minutes are recorded and posted. Um, the last piece of this policy talks about electronic attendance, uh, and it does allow for that, but we still have to have a physical quorum. So we need seven of the 10 members here physically in order to actually be able to move forward uh, with the meeting. So um, an electronic attendance would be if we already had seven members um, here um, present physically. The next policy that you see is policy 1.0, and that's textbook commission meetings rules. Um, so the very first part of this policy talks about Robert's Rules of Order, which this commission does follow through all meetings. Recognition of speakers is up to the chairman. Um, the chairman can recognize a speaker uh, if they so choose. Um, Individuals of the public, community, or educators are welcome to request to speak at any commission meeting. They need to notify the chairman 15 days prior to a meeting, and it is up to the chairman to make the decision as to whether they can speak and for how long. Um, individuals could ask the day of, and that would be at the discretion of the chairman as well. Uh, procedurals for asking questions. The chairman will recognize each individual during the meeting. Um, so if you so choose um, to ask a question, you would um, have the chairman recognize you so that you could speak. Um, if groups uh, request to speak, then they need to have one individual to speak for them. If more than one individual from a group would like to speak, then it would be at the chairman's discretion if they allow more than one individual to present from a particular group um, as well. Um, and so those are just some general guidelines of attendance of the commission members uh, and the meeting with Robert's Rules of Orders. Um, any questions about the policies that we just reviewed? Okay, tab three is substitutions. Um, so the first thing that you'll see is um, the Tennessee rules around substitutions, and I want to just give you um, a brief uh, kind of reminder uh, about this. So um, the, the process to end up with an official state list, uh, once that happens, the department will go into contract with those publishers to lock in a price for our school districts. So our school districts, if they need to replace books, if they have lost for any reason, uh, damaged books, that they will be able to purchase those books at the same cost for the life of that contract, which is generally six years. Um, sometimes a publisher will decide to do a new edition or to update a book, and they ask us to substitute the new edition for the one that's on contract. Um, and so the rules around that substitution is that the books, the old book that's on contract and the new book that the publisher substitute could actually be used in a classroom side by side. So for example, let's say that a teacher has 20 books and a few were damaged and she needs five more books or he for their classroom. And so they would purchase the five new books. If we've had a substitution, that book's going to be slightly different. So when the content experts at the department review the book that is on contract currently and on the official list, and they review the book that the, the publisher would like to substitute, they look at those books side by side, and they say, if I was in a classroom, am I going to be able to teach with some students having one book and some students having another book? And if the answer to that is yes, then we would say yes, we 
recommend to the commission that you approve this substitution? If the answer is no, because there's substantive content changes to that book, then the content expert is going to recommend to the commission that we do not accept that substitution. So a couple of examples of substitutions that have been accepted in the past. Uh, we had a book one time uh, that was a consumable book in the lower grades, uh, and it was an all black and white book, and the publisher decided to make that book all color. So the content, the wording, and the, the photographs, the pictures within the book were exactly the same. It's just it went from black and white to color. Uh, and so that was recommended and approved. Uh, sometimes there is um, some addition maybe of some content. Um, so there would be something added. And so the teacher could uh, in certain ways maybe make a copy for the other books or do some, some minor things that they could still use that content in their classroom. Uh, if there's some pretty substantive changes um, that there's no way you can teach those books side by side, then the content expert is going to recommend uh, to deny that book. Um, so we do have several substitutions that will be um, on the agenda for you to consider uh, just a few minutes in the meeting. So if you will look past the rules, uh, the very next page that um, you have actually is a summary of the substitution. So the, the, the first page only is a summary. All the pages behind that that have a lot of information like ISBNs, that's the full information that the publisher submitted to us. So I would like to point out that this list um, of substitutions has um, a few literature, ELA books uh, at the secondary and high school level, the middle school and high school level. It has a handful of art books. There's one company that um, submitted substitution for a kindergarten through fifth grade visual art book. Um, and then there is a handful of social studies substitutions, social studies books. The content experts that reviewed these uh, recommended to accept uh, all of the books with the exception of one, and it's the very first uh, substitution request on the summary list and I would like to point out the notes to let you know why the content reviewer does not recommend that particular book. Uh, it is a literature and composition book and the way most of the ELA literature and composition books are organized is within a, a unit there's what's called an anchor text and it's usually a longer text and then there will be other texts that generally may be on the same topic or have the same theme. It could be a poem, a song, another short story. But that anchor text really is anchoring around all the standards through that entire unit. Um, within this book, five of the anchor sets were actually changed completely. So five of those units, it would have been almost impossible to teach those two books side by side, which was a, a substantial portion of that text. So that content expert actually recommends not to substitute that. They didn't see really any way teachers um, could teach those two books side by side without really probably um, having to pull tons of supplemental materials. The rest of the books were very similar. It was very minor changes, usually maybe an addition in one area or another, uh, but, but pretty solid, uh, very similar books. Any questions about substitution, the purpose of substitutions, or... Um, the recommendation that the content experts are bringing to you. Okay, so that was um, tab three. So tab four is our screening instruments. So if you were here for our September meeting or if you're a new commission member and you've watched um, the post from our September meetings, you'll know that we did go over these rubrics in detail in September as well. They were in draft uh, format at that time. So we're bringing these screening instruments uh, for Section D, uh, which is social studies, world language, and um, a handful of CTE courses. And we're bringing these screening instruments back to you. Uh, in the meeting, you will actually approve them to be used to review the materials. Um, so the very first screening instrument you have is the sample of social studies. It's the eighth grade screening instrument. Um, and just want to remind, especially for new commission members, that the process that we go through or the panelists that you will recommend uh, in the meeting will go through to review the books is a two-step process. So each of these screening instruments has two sections. The first section is called a non-negotiable. And we really look for the most important things that those materials need so that teachers can teach those standards to a depth of mastery for students. So for example, the standards. So what are the standards? Do we cover the standards? In social studies, we look for 100% that all the standards are there. 
For example, in CTE, we look for 80% of the standards. And the reason being is that in a lot of career and technical education classes, some of the standards is not something that you're gonna find in a book. It may be something to where the teachers and the students are going out and actually working within the industry, uh, that sort of thing. So there are percentages of their standards that you're not gonna find in a book uh, because of the way the courses are designed. Uh, within welding, it may be something that's actually hands-on with the teacher and not necessarily something that you're gonna be able uh, to find in the textbook. So we have an 80% mark there. We also look for other important indicators or expectations within the standards. So for example, uh, looking at the rigor um, of the uh, content that was within the book is also usually in section one. But each of these rubrics is tailored to that particular grade level and subject. So for example, social studies, kindergarten social studies has its own rubric, first grade, second grade, and so forth. And then each of the high school courses also have their own rubric or screening instrument. So we've given you three examples. The first uh, beh behind the tab is the eighth grade social studies. Um, the second one uh, is world language. So if you'll flip, there's a clear tab with behind tab four uh, is world language. And this is a modern uh, language um, rubric. And then we also have classical languages, a rubric for that as well. And then the next clear tab that's you're still behind tab four, uh, you will find a sample of the CTE screening instrument. So um, in section D that we're working on currently for CTE, we have business uh, management uh, and administration. And so those are the CTE areas that we are looking at. Uh, all of the rubrics are posted on the textbook services webpage and you were sent that link to all the rubrics uh, with your materials last week as well so that you would have an opportunity to look at any grade level or subject that you choose. So any questions uh, around the screening instrument? Dr. Shelton, would you uh, elaborate a little bit on the fact that the, the rubric contains every standard for that grade level and how those standards were arrived at and adopted? Oh, yeah, sure. So uh, within Tennessee, the State Board of Education is responsible for content standards for all subjects and all grades. Uh, and that is a very lengthy process. And so State Board starts by posting uh, current standards online to take public feedback. Um, when we did the social studies adoption, the public feedback was extensive uh, that we received. And so then they actually go out and they hire educators. So and they get a really good breadth of teachers in the classroom that are teaching that subject in grade level. Also uh, instructional coaches, some administrators. Um, so they had the feedback from the public online. They pull in the educators and they meet hours, face-to-face -face hours and hours as they look at the public feedback um, and they look at the standards taking in their own expertise teaching those particular uh, subjects in grade levels. And so then they would revise standards. They would be put forth to state board and then state board would adopt those revised standards from that point. So it's a pretty lengthy process that state board manages uh, that involves not only educators, but also uh, constituent and public comment as well. Um, after that, the department works with content experts to draft these rubrics. We also base these rubrics uh, on other screening instruments for instructional materials um, that have been proven uh, to do a good job and there's research behind those tools. Uh, but we adopt those to be very specific to Tennessee, including like I stated that each grade level and subject has its own screening instrument for the materials, we actually embed all of the standards within these screening instruments so that when the reviewers are looking at the materials and they have their screening instrument in front of them, they're literally not trying to go back to a different or separate document and find standards. Everything that they need to review them is within uh, the screening instrument. So it makes them a little bit longer, but everything that that reviewer needs is right here embedded within the screening instrument. And one more thing, uh, this year, in fact, with the social studies standards, there was some legislative action as well that made some revision to 
to the standards too, correct? Uh, yes, that's it. That's exactly uh, correct. So uh, as you know, uh, last session in 2017, uh, we had that Tennessee history bill that actually passed and is in law. So the standards had actually went to state board uh, in April of two 2017 and had passed on first read. Of course, uh, the state board can have adjustments between first and second read and then the Tennessee history law passed. So what the state board did at that point was call the um, the standards uh, writers back in um, and, uh, of course, presented uh, the new statute to them and actually had the, the educators that were the original writers determine where it would be best to fit the Tennessee history course. That course ended up being in the second half of fifth grade. Um, so when that course was put in fifth grade, then the standards shifted a little bit in the lower grades. Um, so third through fifth grade standards shifted slightly. So now you see fourth grade uh, being uh, about two thirds of U.S. history that starts at colonization and goes to reconstruction. And then the second half, or the first half of fifth grade finishes that. So fourth grade and one half of your fifth grade school year, students will learn uh, colonization up through reconstruction after the Civil War. The second half of fifth grade, our students will have a standalone Tennessee history course. Um, all of this had taken place by the September meeting, and at the September meeting, uh, we actually brought you the fifth grade screening instrument so you could see how fifth grade was unique to all the other grades uh, in social studies, and that that instrument looked a little bit different because it took into account that fifth grade uh, was actually split in half half U.S. and half Tennessee history. And so that was the sample uh, that was used in September, and I would encourage you to uh, go to the link uh, and review that fifth grade um, screening instrument specifically because it's slightly different uh, than the other ones and a little bit longer because it does cover those, those two areas uh, in fifth grade. Other questions about screening instruments? Okay, let's look at our next tab. Uh, so five is section D. Uh, we're gonna have an update here. You just saw the screening instruments that we're going to go into. And I did put two timelines at the very front of this tab. Uh, the first timeline, as you'll notice, it'll say cycle one at the top. Uh, this is a large picture timeline. This spans 12 years. Um, and you can see where each section is listed. And if you'll notice, um, section C, which, was that, which is actually science, our local school districts right now are working with section C, uh, which is science, fine arts, and the small number of CTE courses. So currently our local school districts are reviewing samples of books that are in, in, in section C. Section D, which is what you are addressing today, is social studies, world language, marketing, finance, business management and administration. And so these are the books that uh, publishers have just sent bids in and that we are looking uh, to hire the panelists uh, to use the screening instruments you just reviewed uh, to review these bids. Um, and so just to point out where we are in the larger cycle uh, of things, we're on section D here. The next page uh, behind tab five is a detailed schedule. And this is the detailed schedule for section D. Um, one thing I want to note for you is I did give you a color copy, and so anything that you see in red is actually the textbook commission meeting, so that's your work. Anything that is in blue is the State Board of Education meeting dates to where they will uh, consider anything that you have recommended to the State Board. Um, everything in black is just the work that kind of happens in between the meetings with the panelists, the reviewers, and so forth, and if um, any of the information is in bold, those are dates that publishers need to be aware of. Maybe a deadline for their bids, a deadline for uh, them to respond to reviews, those sorts of things. So if it's black and bold, it's for publishers uh, to be aware of. And so this is just uh, the date, if you'll notice, on the, about midway down on the first half of the page, that's where we are in this cycle, March 19th commission meeting. Uh, and then to finish out section D, it'll be the rest of this page in the back. Um, it takes about 18 months to go through a complete cycle uh, of one of these sections. So you can see what will happen between here um, and the next meeting. Um, so one other thing I wanna point out for you to be uh, just kind of thinking about is at the end uh, of the actual meeting, um, 
I will ask you for dates for the September meetings. So maybe at break, you may want to look at your calendar and see if you have um, any ideas uh, for specific dates uh, for the meeting. Um, some suggestions uh, will be we need to have two meetings in September, and the reason we have two is that we have the first meeting to where we present to you the recommended list from the panelists that you will hire today. Um, and then we want to give you time to review that, that official list that they're recommending before you actually vote. So we'll bring the list to you at the 1st of September, and then we need to meet by the end of September after you had an opportunity to review the materials for you then to recommend the official list that will go to State Board in October. So it's a very tight, tight, tight turnaround with those two meetings, but we want to make sure you have a couple of weeks in between to have time to review the materials. So um, the dates that would be recommended, probably that second week in September, so somewhere around the 11th, 12th, or 13th of September. We actually struggle to get these rooms with live streaming on Monday, so I would suggest a Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday meeting if possible, um, or possibly even September 6th, which is the Thursday before. Uh, remember that if we pushed back too early in September, our publishers um, have the ability to revise their product based on the reviewer's comments. So if our reviewers have said, you know, this is maybe something you need to fix, the publishers have that opportunity. So we actually won't have the final, and then the reviewers would have to go back and review any changes. So we won't have those final reviews in until literally that last week of August or the first couple of days of September. So I think the 6th is the earliest that we could have the materials ready for you. Tammy, I'm sorry, those yes. dates mm -hmm. again. September 6th, 11th, 12th, or 12th, 13th. 12th, if I'm not mistaken, Dr. Kirk. The, the TOS conference, I okay. think, is that week. So we gotcha. may need to look at the 6th. Okay, great. Um, and then the end of September would be that last week, the 25th, 26th, or 27th. We can, if we need to, push to the first or second day of the next week into October. It will make our materials late for state board. We have had to do that in years past, but if we can make it work on the 25th through the 27th, then we won't be late to state board. Um, so I'll let you think about those dates. You can talk about them at break, and we'll bring that topic back up during the actual meeting. So um, you just saw the detailed schedule for Section D, which was the second piece of paper behind Tab 5. Uh, if you'll flip past that, the next thing that you see is actually a rubric uh, that content experts use to screen the applicants um, that have been brought to you today to hire to review the instructional screen, uh, the instructional materials. Um, so we just wanted you to see the detail or level of detail that we use to actually review those applications. Uh, we actually had a committee that came together on February the 8th. I was looking to make sure, I'm pretty sure it was February the 8th, um, of content experts to review the applications. And Dr. Campbell uh, at, at the time was the active chair of the commission, and he also came to that meeting and reviewed applications using this uh, rubric as well. Um, so after the rubric, um, you can see the applications. So we actually, um, this time, um, had applications out for educators and non-educators. Um, so as you know, if, if you were at the September meeting or if you have watched uh, the posting of the September meeting, uh, this commission was asked by uh, several members of our uh, legislative body to um, really try to recruit non-educators to also be on the panel uh, to review the screening instrument. And so the commission actually, in the two September meetings in 2017, came up with some ideas and charged the department uh, with doing several things to help recruit non-educators. And so we did those things. We, uh, we sent emails out to uh, a lot of organizations that were not educator organizations. So for one example, uh, the Tennessee Museum Association. So we sent out um, emails and, and had um, information sent to their uh, listserv. So they actually then, the Tennessee uh, Museum Association sent out more emails from there. Um, so we reached out to a lot of uh, areas that were non-educators. Um, and so 
At that point, you'll see slight differences in the application this year than in the past. Uh, we did ask whether the individual was an educator or non-educator that they would write a letter of intent. So what was the reasoning behind their desire uh, to serve as a panelist and review instructional materials? If the individual was an educator, we asked them to submit an original lesson plan. So we're asking them to review lesson plans in unit and uh, curriculum. So we want to know that they can also create it if that's their job and they're doing it every day. So we asked them to, to uh, submit an original um, lesson to us. And then we also asked for two letters of recommendation. If the individual was an educator, we asked for one of those letters to be uh, their direct supervisor, whether it was a principal or a central office supervisor, but one of their direct, um, somebody that they reported directly to. Uh, and so then you can see the instructions. Uh, and you can see areas where, for example, two letters of recommendation, we distinguish between educator and a non-educator applicant. And of course, if it was a non-educator, they did not submit uh, a lesson plan. Um, and so there's a, a few of the differences, and then they also had to submit their resume. Question? Yeah, do you have, you have, a, you have a list of these panelists right now? I, I do, and I'm, I'm gonna show you that in just a second after we look at the application. And you pretty much got them laid out who's going to do, who's going to review what? So we have them uh, in recommended grade bands at this point, but not assigned a particular book, but it will show you the grade band. Okay. Um, and we can, one last thing on the application, and then we'll move on to that list. Um, the applications also were tailored to the subject. So um, as you can see, if you flip past that initial application that you came across in your notebook, was actually social studies. The next one is the world language ap application, and then the final application was CTE. So we had three applications based on those three uh, content areas. And so if you'll flip past the last application, you will see the list uh, of the panelists that are being recommended to you today at the meeting uh, to serve on a panel to review books. Uh, and so the first list uh, is social studies, which is a little bit longer than the other list. So it, it uh, spans the first page and onto the second page. And I will point out that on this list of social studies reviewer, we have five non-educators. Uh, so, um, and, I, and they're, they're mixed in because they're not listed by educator and non-educator, uh, but we have Kara Duke, um, actually works for MTSU, but is not a professor. She works for the university, but is not a teacher or educator uh, or professor. Uh, Jim Faulkner, uh, Danielle uh, Kaminsky, Hal Rounds, and Jeff Sellers. Um, all of those are non-educators. Jeff Sellers, I believe, works for the Tennessee State Museum. And Danielle uh, Kaminsky, um, uh, she actually works for the Holocaust, or is ser serves on the Holocaust Commission. Um, and so I could get more detail if you wanted to uh, see any of the applications from these other five individuals or any of the other educators that applied. Would be glad to send you their application if you would like to see that on any of those individuals. We have also listed any alternates. Um, so we, we did not have any alternates for CTE because we had a low number of applicants. We did have a significant number of applicants for social studies. And if somebody passed the screening, this, the rubric, we went on and list them as an alternate. Um, we actually have in the past have had reviewers at the last minute pull out because of a family vacation or all of a sudden there's a family wedding that's going to happen. And so many things happen in the summer for individuals that's last minute. Um, we have had so anybody that actually qualified, uh, we, we put them on the alternate list. Um, so after social studies, um, you will see, oh, go ahead. Mm -hmm. One of these alternates actually is one of my teachers in mm -hmm. my school. Is that a conflict? I just want to make sure that known up front. Mm -mm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so then you see, so after the social studies, we have world language, and you can see we've, uh, of course, that is specified out by the actual language. Uh, we didn't have a large number of applicants in world language, and you can see our only two alternates are Latin. Um, we only had, I believe, two, maybe it's two books bid in Latin, so there's a small number there. And then your last list of um, panelists is for the CTE books. So, um, any questions about how the panelists were selected to be recommended to you? So did we have enough 
for CT to cover it? Or is that going to be a burden on them? You no. Know, so we did. Um, the majority of the ones listed in CTE are reviewing between seven and ten books. Um, it, it's a little bit heavier of a load. We really like individuals to review between four and six to seven. Um, but we do have a stipend that is on a scale, so they will be compensated more than, for example, a social studies reviewer that does five or four books. How, how many total applicants did you did you have for the process? You, uh, and I'm so sorry, I can get that information you know, for you just, just off the top of my head. It was head. a uh, high percentage mm -hmm. that qualified. Yeah, or? we actually had a yeah, very high percentage that qualified. Mm -hmm. um, we just had really strong applicants um, this time, so which was great. Yes. I can answer that. We have 110 for social studies. We had 28 for world language, and then everybody on the CTE list is what we had. Are there questions about applicants, the application, or how this list uh, was compiled to recommend for you today? Okay, sec uh, tab six, let's move on to tab six. So the first thing that you have behind tab six is all of the courses that fall under section D. So any course that is permanent course uh, within our schools is listed here. So publishers were sent this list of all these courses that they could possibly bid for in December. Uh, with, well, and they actually were sent uh, the list in October 1st, uh, and we actually just do what we call an intent to bid in October, and we're like, what would you like to bid? It doesn't bind publishers to a bid, but it gives us an idea of how many bids we might receive so that we can start recruiting panelists. Uh, then in December, they're sent this list again with all of the official paperwork that they would have to fill out to bid. Um, so as you can see, it lists all of our social studies courses. There's a lot of courses in foreign language, including, uh, as I'm sure you and the commissioner are aware, American Sign Language. Unfortunately, we did not have any publisher bid uh, for sign language. Um, then be behind the courses, you will see the outcome of the official bids that you uh, will be presented with at the commission. Um, and when you look at this page, the left side of the page lists the intent to bid, the publishers that showed interest. And then on the right side, you will see the actual bids. And so for social studies, we had 39 bids. For world language, we had uh, 91 bids, and for CTE, we had 29 bids for a total of 159 um, books or programs um, that are bid in this cycle D. I broke a sum. I took a summary on the next page to break it down for you just a little bit more. Um, so if you see on this, I left CT CTE together at 29, but I broke the social studies down for you. So in K2, we had three bids in social studies. Historically in Tennessee, we have a very low number of bids in K-2. A lot of our districts do not purchase K-2 social studies books, and so we, we generally have a low bid. In fact, I think three, I think um, the last time that social studies was adopted, we only had one bid in K-2. So that's nice that we have some more selection there this time. In 3-5, we had eight. In 6-8, we had nine. In high school, we had 19 bids in social studies. And then I break uh, world language down for you by the subject. If you'll notice, Spanish, we have 56 bids in Spanish. Um, there's a lot there. Um, the nice thing about the Spanish bids is they span K-12. We have some that are literally just the lower grades. Um, the publishers have also done some unique things this year with the foreign language. So, for example, Spanish, we have several books in Spanish 1 that are bid over two years. So, for example, and most of them were at the middle school level. So if I wanted to offer Spanish to my students at middle school, but maybe it was on a rotating basis and they were only there once a week, they actually have bid an, an A and a B that covers just Spanish 1, so it stretches uh, the standards out over a longer period of time to give districts flexibility. And we have several books that is Spanish 1, a one-year program. Uh, so even in middle school or the elementary school, if you wanted to have a submergent pro submergent program to where they were really uh, focused and, and um, teaching that uh, quickly within a year, those are offered there as well. So there's a lot of variety in the way 
the Spanish is treated uh, in these bids, which I think is good to give our districts a lot of flexibility. Any questions about the bids? Okay, that concludes our workshop items. Thank you, Dr. Shelton, very thorough. Uh, do any commission members have questions in general or any specific questions about the items on our agenda today? If not, we're going to recess, take about a 10 minute break and then we'll come back together to um, have our meeting.
And you know what? We've got Hamlin's. I just noticed stuff on here. Well, I don't know. Why, but that's got to be fixed. That's not the where are they at? Here we go. Look at that. Oh, oh, oh. I mean, not Hamlin.
We're going to convene in about two minutes. Good morning. I'm going to call this meeting of the textbook, textbook Commission for the State of Tennessee, March 19, 2018, to order. As Secretary of the Commission, I will serve as chair until a chair is elected on our agenda this morning. Mrs. Brew, will you call the roll? Kay Kelsey? Here. Frank Cagle? Here. Vicki Kirk? Here. Kelsey Reese? Neil Durbin? Here. Randall Fenimore? Here. Karen King? Here. Kyle Mallory? Here. Dr. Kirk, you have a quorum. Thank you, Mrs. Brew, and I would like to thank each member of the commission for being here this morning. We do need to have a quorum so that we can meet on time, and I'd extend a, a special thank you to Mr. Mallory for agreeing to serve an additional um, meeting. Uh, he came uh, so that we could have a quorum, and everybody made that effort, and I do appreciate it. Um, Dr. Shelton, will you introduce the staff for us, please, before we begin? Uh, yes, I am Tammy Shelton, Senior Executive Director uh, for the Department of Education, uh, and uh, serve uh, the commission uh, to help you with your work and I will let the rest of the department staff introduce themselves. I'm Rachel Brew. I'm the recording secretary for the commission and also the administrative assistant for uh, Tammy Shelton. Hi, Joanna Collins, assistant general counsel for procurement for the department, and I'm here to support the work of the commission. Thank you. Now we'll begin our agenda. I will take a motion to approve the consent items, which include the adoption of today's agenda and the approval of the October 2nd, 2017 minutes. Do I have a motion? You have a motion. Thank you, Mr. Mallory. Do I have a second? Second. Second. Thank you, Mr. Durbin. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? It is unanimous. We'll move on into our action items for today's meeting. And the first item is the election of a chairman. We are accepting nominations for the chair at this time. Those commissioners who have been approved for service for this coming year are eligible to serve as chair. Do I have a nomination for chair? Nominate Mr. Neil Durbin. I second. Thank you. We have a, no a motion and a nomination for Mr. Neil Durbin. Uh, any other nominations? Do I have a motion that the nominations cease? So moved. Second. I'll make a second. All in favor of the nomination ceasing, aye. 
Aye. Aye. Opposed? Nominations will cease. Now we will vote on chair. All in favor of Mr. Durbin serving as chair? Roll call vote on this one. My apologies. Tammy's keeping me on my toes. We're going to have a roll call vote, Mrs. Brew, on uh, election of the chair. Randall Fettermore? Yes. Kay Kelsey? Yes. Neil Durbin? Yes. Karen King? Yes. Frank, Frank Cagle? Yes. Dr. Vicki Kirk? Yes. Kyle Mallory? Yes. Dr. Kirk, you have seven yeses. Thank you, Mrs. Brew. And now, uh, if Mr. Durbin will take the chair's seat, we will proceed with the meeting and he will chair the remainder of this meeting. Did we ever vote approval of the of the minutes? Okay. Our next order is to elect a vice chair. Open for nominations. I don't know. My name is Kelsey. Okay. If you want it, if you don't want it. <laughs> I did not have that option, I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> we have a nomination for Ms. Kelsey. Have you done well? Oh, she doesn't want it. Oh, okay. It's not that I don't want it. I feel like I need maybe a little more experience. That would be the consensus among all of us. <laughs> Any other nominations? I make a motion um, to nominate Mr. I make a motion to nominate Mr. Randall Fenimore okay. for vice chair. Nomination, Mr. Fenimore. Do I have a second? A second. We have a second, Ms. Kelsey. Any other nominations? Do I have a motion that nominations are closed? You have that motion. Motion that nominations are closed by Mr. Mallory. And I assume this will be a roll call vote. Mm -hmm. Randall Fenimore? Yes. Kay Kelsey? Yes. Neil Durbin? Yes. Karen King? Yes. Frank Cagle? Yes. Dr. Kirk? Yes. Kyle Mallory? Yes. Mr. Chairman, you have seven yeses. Thank you, Mr. Fenimore. Okay, the next item on the agenda will be the recommendation of the tech textbook and instructional material substitutions. At this time, we'll recognize Dr. Shelton. Thank you. Um, so behind tab three, you will see the rule for substitutions. And just as a quick reminder, we discussed this in the workshop. But as a quick reminder, uh, if a publisher would like to substitute a newer edition of a textbook uh, during the life of the contract, uh, we have content experts uh, at the department that will review the old book and the new book to ensure that those books can be taught in the classroom side by side. So they should be very small and minor changes so that it doesn't affect instruction in the classroom. Uh, you have a short list on the very next page of those books that have been proposed uh, by publishers to substitute. Uh, it was a list that had a handful of high school ELA, uh, English language arts books, um, a handful of high school social studies books, and then uh, one uh, company with some visual art books in kindergarten through fifth grade. All were recommended uh, for approval except the first one on your list, which was a literature and composition book. The content expert um, that reviewed that book noted that five of the anchor texts around five units were different. 
uh, which would really lead to um, a very difficult time for a teacher to use those books side by side. Any questions? If there are no questions of Dr. Shelton, I assume we make a motion. We'll accept a motion. I'll make that. Mr. Mallory made a motion. Second. I'll second it. Second, Mr. Cagle. <laughs> Voice vote. Roll call. Roll call vote. Randall Fenimore. Yes. Kay Kelsey. Yes. Neil Durbin. Yes. Karen King. Yes. Frank Cagle. Yes. Dr. Kirk. Yes. Kyle Mallory. Yes. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, you have seven yeses. Thank you. Item D on the action agenda, <coughs> textbook and instruction material screening instrument. Dr. Shelton. Yes, before you for this item is the approval uh, of the screening instruments that will be used to review uh, the uh, materials that will be bid in section D. <coughs> you have three samples in your binder that we did go through in the workshop behind tab four. Your first example is the social studies grade eight. Your second example was world language for modern languages. And the third example uh, was for CTE, uh, business management and administration. All the screening instruments are posted on the textbook services website and you were sent that link last week for your preview. Thank you, Dr. Shelton. We have a motion to accept the screening instrument. Make a motion we accept the screening instrument as is. I'll second. Okay, motion, Mr. Fenimore. Second, Mr. Mallory. Roll call vote. Randall Fenimore. Yes. Kay Kelsey. Yes. Neil Durbin. Yes. Karen King. Yes. Frank Cagle. Yes. Dr. Kirk. Yes. Kyle Mallory. Yes. Mr. Chairman, you have seven yeses. Thank you. Item E, the approval of the panelists for Section D review. Dr. Shelton. Thank you. So behind tab five, uh, you have a list of panelists that are being brought to you or recommended to you uh, to hire to review the screening, uh, review the instructional materials that have been bid. Uh, the first on the list is social studies. Included in this social studies list are five non-educators. The rest are educators, either K-12 or higher education. Your list uh, also gives the county of residents for each individual and the grade band in social studies that they uh, would be reviewing. Um, as you notice, we do have a spread across the state. We also have um, rural counties, urban, uh, various sizes. So we do think we have a good spread of our state represented here as well. After the social studies list, uh, you will see world language. Um, in social studies and world language, there is also an alternative list. So if we have a panelist pull out for any reason over the summer, we do have some individuals that you've approved that we can pull up to finish that work and that review. And then the last page is CTE reviewers uh, that have been hired. I would like to note um, something that I failed to mention in the workshop is that for social studies, uh, we have anywhere from three to five panelists that will serve for each book. Um, so definitely in our third grade through middle school and our high school required graduation courses, we have five individuals that will review each of those books specifically. So how many people will review the other books? Uh, so we have in CTE and World Language, we have two reviewing each of those. And in a handful of the social studies, it's three. Uh, for example, psychology and sociology, mm -hmm. we actually also had a limited number of applicants. And then in the K-2 area, we actually prioritize teachers of K-5 and put them in the 3-5 band so that we could have five there since that was U.S. history and Tennessee history. Okay. Any other questions for Dr. Schell? Okay, take a motion for to approve the panelists. Make a motion. Thank you, Mr. Mallory. Second. Thank you, Mr. Fenimore. Roll call, Randall Fenimore. Yes. Kay Kelsey. Yes. Neil Durbin. Yes. Karen King. 
Yes. Frank Cagle? Yes. Dr. Kirk? Yes. Kyle Mallory? Yes. Mr. Chairman, you have seven yeses. Thank you. Um, item four on the agenda of the, the uh, presentations dealing with the acknowledgement of Section D bits. Dr. Shelp. Thank you. Um, so behind tab six, um, you first have the list of all uh, courses that were possible uh, categories that a publisher could bid. And if you will turn past that, you will see the actual bids that came in. The first summary page that you have lists each of the publishers and it lists where they had a bid, whether it was in Social Studies World Language or CTE. The total bids that we had for Social Studies was 39, World Language 91, and CTE 29. And then the second summary page will also list for you a breakdown in Social Studies by grade band and then in World Language by the actual language. You also last week were sent the full spreadsheet of all um, of the pieces of each bid. So we have listed for you on the summary sheets a program or a textbook, but along with that textbook also comes a teacher's edition and other ancillary materials uh, with that. So the full spreadsheet spreadsheet that you received last week was very long uh, because it has all of the ancillary materials along with teachers editions as well. Um, we do have one uh, company on here that has bid a complete online program so there's no hardback materials at all with that company and all of the companies have options have online options within their bids so even if a textbook um, literally here you're seeing one list because it's one piece of content that the reviewer will review there are many options that a district can have within the bid. So for example, the companies that have the online options may offer a one-year subscription, a two-year subscription, a six-year subscription. Um, they may also offer different pricing, whether it is a school-based pricing or a district-based pricing. Sometimes they offer pricing by number of students, so a smaller school uh, could purchase a six-year <coughs> subscription with maybe one to 49 students and a larger school, maybe 50 to 100 or, or so forth. So there's a lot of different purchasing options with each of these programs. So the spreadsheet you received is quite lengthy because it has all of those options listed, but this summary list narrows it down to the one program, which is the content of that textbook that the student will see that the reviewers that you have just hired will actually review. Any questions about the bids? What about the, what, is that just with CTE? So no, everything I just stated is for all. So like for example, even a so fifth, fifth grade social studies book, uh, you might possibly have multiple options for purchasing, some online options, hardback options, those sorts of things. But the content in all of those options is exactly the same for the student edition and the teacher edition. So Dr. Shelton, did we, because of supply and simple supply and demand, did we not get submissions for courses that we're offering across the state? So yes, that's true and that happens uh, each year. Um, so sometimes we just literally, especially in CTE, we literally end up with zero bids, uh, which then it does uh, put more, um, it puts more effort on the district to actually find those materials or maybe even piece together. Uh, some districts may pull from open source, maybe some materials they already have, and will piece together a program as well. And, and a lot of our districts do that, and they have that choice if they so choose. But we always end up with some courses that we do not have bids for. And I'm going to make an assumption that none of those courses would be anything that's actual requirement for graduation. No, everything that's a re graduation requirement, we did receive uh, bids for. The lowest number of bids for a required course was in our K-2 social studies area, and we had three bids there. Okay. Any other questions? Dr. Shelton, can you identify the publisher that's going to do all online that's not a physical textbook? And I will, hold on, I'll have to look, because do you remember, Rachel, which publisher that was? No. I Wouldn't it be the socialstudies.com? Yeah, I, I think this, I'll have to go back and look exactly. CEVE, CEV Multimedia is generally all online as well, so we may have two. I, I'm pretty sure one of them was in social studies. I will actually go back and when we send out uh, the minutes, I will put that in the email for you. Thank you. 
Does that cause any problems with the rubric as far as? Um, no. So okay. the, the rubric, uh, the non-negotiable, which is the first piece that actually would keep a publisher off the list, is looking for the content itself. Mm -hmm. uh, the second half of the rubric, which <coughs> um, is what we call additional criteria, um, if a publisher does not have a piece of that, it doesn't keep them off the list. We take uh, detail or give detailed feedback in the rubric there to help districts because it's things that may may be unique to districts, uh, so that does not prevent them. But we do try to highlight feedback there so districts know because we don't want them to purchase and then not have the devices needed to use that. So we, we just make notes there on that for district use. Any other questions? We'll take a motion. You got it. Sorry. Mo Sorry. Don't need a motion. Okay. Move to um, section five, the announcements and notices. Okay, we'll look at the schedules for the meeting. So, yes, yeah, so the only thing that the department um, is asking in this section is that we choose two meeting dates for September. As mentioned in the workshop, we need to have a meeting early in September and one later in September. Uh, it's nice to have at least two weeks in between those meetings so that you have time to review the list that is being recommended to you by the reviewers that you just um, hired. Um, so some dates that were proposed in the workshop were September 6th, 11th, 12th, or 13th for the first meeting. And I'll let y'all discuss the first meeting, and then we'll decide. I think we decided second. we had to have it on the 6th because of a, a meet, an, uh, another meeting, correct? It, it would be the most um, comfortable for the department, I think. Is that, that true, Dr. Curry? I'll make a motion. We have it on the 6th and the twenty. We'll, we'll take one, you want to one, at, one time. at a time? Yeah, well, and we don't actually have to have a motion. Don't. Yeah, if we if can you just, just want to see if you that. have a consensus and let me know. I'm good with the six. Does anybody else have a comment on the six? Let's do, we'll take these. That's a Thursday. And I assume, Dr. Shelton, that would be here again. Uh, or we, we'd we have will, to find out. We will try. And okay. I, since we're not in session in September, more than likely the answer yeah. is yes. But as soon as you give us dates, we will secure a location. Okay, so if everybody's good on the 6th. 25th. 25th. The 25th is a Tuesday. And if anybody else has an opinion on that, I'm good on the 25th. If anybody else has any comments. Okay. That's great. So the 6th and the 25th. I assume if there are any issues with that, mm -hmm. yes, we'll just have to get back in touch through email. Yes, that, that's I fine. And we'll, we'll secure a location within the next week and send out that those dates will be good. Uh, my next question is 10 a.m. a good time to start the workshop and the meeting uh, immediately follow. Ms. Cagle, is that good? You, you, I, I assume y'all are traveling the most. Right, Friday's not a good day. Okay. 10 o'clock, good for everybody. Okay. That's good for me. Okay. Great. Any other business for the commission? I have a yes. question. Um, one of the, um, I know it was the Tennessee uh, Textbook and Materials Commission, and I'm going down the road of on materials, specifically testing. There was an article in the Tennessee Star that we're having more testing problems for the fourth year in a row. Are they, are they going to be settled? So this commission actually is for where it says materials is instructional materials. And the reason it says textbooks and instructional materials is, for example, the one vendor that bid all online, there's not a hardback physical book. So that's the reason the commission adds instructional materials, but actually the commission uh, doesn't necessarily have anything to do with the assessment. I can uh, give you contact information at the department to answer any assessment questions that you might have. I'll just say this, if y'all, I know it's, you're not in, this is not in your line, in your division, but four years will really look bad if y'all mess this one up. Any other comments? Okay, take a motion to adjourn.
I'll make that motion. Thank you, Mr. Mallory. Second. Second. Okay. All in, we're adjourned.